you will see that I am very enthused about Lightroom. And you will think that I am working for Adobe. The fact is, I pay $10 a month like everybody else. But I'm enthused about it because I live on it. I use it all the time. And for many photographers like myself, um, it is the Swiss army knife, so to speak, of digital photography. When you have thousands and thousands of images, Lightroom is an extremely efficient way to do lots of things, to keyword entire batches all at once, to tweak similar pictures all at once and not having to do each one individually, to export them, to crop them. You can do the same thing over and over again just by doing one. So it's a very, very efficient uh, system. You're going to see in Lightroom there are usually three ways to do everything. There'll be a drop-down menu. You can right-click and get a context menu, or you can use a keyboard shortcut. For teaching purposes, I always go with the drop-down menus because they're words and they make sense to people. On the other hand, I can't teach you Lightroom in two hours. <laughs> There's way too much going on. I, my goal here is to show you what's possible, how it works, why it's so wonderful, what you can do, how it will help your workflow, how it will help you find things. But I cannot stop and show you where every single button and menu is because I do that at ICP. We teach a two-day workshop in this. It's really hands-on. People bring their laptops and Lightroom, and we do the nitty-gritty right in the class. Here, it's an overview. Hopefully, when you leave today, you'll be enthused. You'll understand why it has become you know, the standard for many, many photographers now because it helps me find things very quickly, access them, and do something with it. I can export it, upload it to Facebook, whatever I want to do, it's all there. It's very, very fast. So I've got my list of all the things I'll try to remember to show you today. And so let's get started. So now we're going to jump into Lightroom. The latest, greatest is Lightroom 6. Um, it's available on a disk, uh, and that disk you can use it for either a Mac or a PC. You can put it on any two computers at the same time, and you can buy it in this store or anywhere else for $145, and you own it. You own it forever. There are no recurring costs. Um, the trouble is that any of the new features and new upgrades, of course, will not be available. Um, for a while, Adobe will support new camera raw files, but after a few years, you will not be able to read your pictures in Lightroom if you have a brand new camera and you have a disk that's three years old. I have a private student who bought Lightroom 5 on the disk. It was fine for years. She just bought a new Fuji camera and called me up and said, I can't see the files. Well, that's what happens when you have an older disk. And also with this, you do not get any of the mobile services, so you can't connect to your cell phone back and forth and you can't share online. Um, the latest iteration now at Adobe and many other software companies are doing is the Lightroom subscription model. And it's called Creative Cloud, and a particular version of the subscription is the photography subscription, which is $10 a month. It includes both Photoshop and Lightroom. Now, like many of you, I don't like to be married to a company forever. On the other hand, I used to pay $700 every two years or so for Photoshop and another $150 a year for Lightroom. So it really is, for someone like myself, actually a lot cheaper, especially if you use both Lightroom and Photoshop. The nice thing is you start with Lightroom. As you get comfortable, then you can graduate to a much more sophisticated, harder-to-learn program called Photoshop. You can go back and forth between the two very easily. Um, you can pay by the month or the entire year. People think because you pay a subscription, it's not your software. But the fact is, the software will reside on your computer. Lightroom will be there even if you stop paying. But to authenticate it, you've got to be connected to the internet at least once every 99 days. So if you live on top of a mountain somewhere, that might be a problem. For the rest of us, it's not a problem at all. So the image files, the original files that came out of your camera, are stored on your computer. They're not owned by Adobe. And with the subscription, you get another 20 gigabytes of cloud storage. But the cloud storage disappears when you stop paying them. For some reason, it goes away. Supposedly, they will give you lots of warnings, but you've got to be careful. 
the good thing about Creative Cloud is that all the new features, all the new upgrades, all the new camera raw files, obviously are constantly updated with your subscription. And you can also use the mobile feature to sync uh, between your smartphones and your tablets and your computer. And again, like the standalone disk, you can install it on any two computers. And I actually have four computers, and it's very easy to uninstall it on one, put it on another one. If I take that computer on the trip, I can switch them back and forth. It's very, very simple to do. So even though I have four computers, I only have one subscription, which gives me two simultaneous computers. I mentioned the 20 gigabytes of cloud storage, which I do not use. Um, but the nice thing about that is you can show your pictures to anybody who has an email account by using their, their cloud. Um, again, if you stop paying, your catalog will continue to function. So all the work you've done in keywording and finding your pictures will not be lost if you stop paying. You will lose the ability to develop, tweak, you know, crop, lighten, darken, contrast, all that stuff. That's gone. The map module, if you use that for GPS location, and any syncing with your mobile device or future raw files, you do lose that. But you don't lose the catalog. You don't use, lose all the keywording work and all the tweaking that you did to your photographs. And your cloud storage drops from 20 gigabytes to 2 gigabytes. So let's talk about the structure of Lightroom, what it looks like. Here's the basic Lightroom screen. When you open it up, this is what you see. And on the top row are the five, or I'm sorry, seven modules that Lightroom has, and we'll go through these one at a time. So the main module that we use right away is called the library module. And the first thing is you use it for downloading uh, initially, um, either from a memory card or from existing um, folders that are in your computer. You also use the library for future retrieval to find your pictures. You also use it for editing and selecting, picking out the good ones, the bad ones, the ones you may want to use, the ones that are going into the book, the ones you want to email. You'll also use the library for adding more information to the existing picture. Metadata is information, words, that attach themselves to the bowels of your file. And captions, keywords, GPS location, uh, copyright, IPTC is for photojournalists for lots of information. You will then add that after you bring your pictures into Lightroom. And then you'll also use the library when you want to do something finally with all these pictures. You want to make a book. You want to export it to email. It's going to go up to Facebook. You're going to put big files in Dropbox. So the library screen is one you'll be using a lot. The next main screen, which I'll show you a lot, is the develop module. And this is where you tweak your pictures. So you do some of the basic things, exposure, crop, color correct, and contrast, and highlights, and shadows, and saturation, and noise, all that kind of stuff you do in the develop module. You can straighten out your pictures, convert it to black and white, and you can sharpen them also. Up until a few years ago, Lightroom would only work on the entire picture. You couldn't work on any local parts of the photograph. And so a few years ago, the newer versions came out with gradients, so you can taper an effect across a certain part of a picture. You can now do spotting and cloning if you have dust spots on your sensor, for example, or a cigarette butt on the street that shouldn't be there. You can spot it out. And so now there are brushes where you can make the sky only a little darker, or the foreground a little darker, or you can lighten up or darken somebody's face without affecting the whole picture. So brushes are a relatively new feature and it's very, very nice. You can do things that you could only do in Photoshop before you can do to some degree in Lightroom. There's no doubt that Photoshop is more precise, more sophisticated, but for a lot of people, the brushes in Lightroom are more than adequate. The next big module is print. I know a lot of people don't print anymore. They don't even know what prints are. They only look at their pictures on their cell phone. But if you like to print in the print module, you can do your layout, how big, how small, how big the borders are. You can even put your copyright notice on there. You can change the background color and you can make borders. You can make contact sheets. A picture package is where you put a few different size images on the same sheet of paper to print it out. 
There are other modules which we'll cover a little uh, less intently. You can make slideshows. I'm going to show you one with a little music. You can make a book directly from Lightroom through a company called Blurb. And you can also sync back and forth with your mobile devices. And the last module is the map. If your camera or your link, uh, sync with your phone, you can put GPS information so that you click on the picture, a map opens up, and it shows you where you are standing when you took the photograph. So that's an overview of the seven modules. So let's start with the library module, because that's where we're going to do our organizing, cataloging, and retrieving of pictures. Uh, I do a fair amount of private lessons in both photography and Lightroom and Photoshop, and people usually call me up and they say, Lester, this is my problem. <laughs> people have stuff all over their computer, and they can't. Does that sound familiar? You're all laughing, right? Um, I understand, and if you pay attention today, your life will be better organized by 6 o'clock today. And to prove that this works, I'm going to do a demonstration for you. So I'm going to open up Lightroom now. And this is my Lightroom catalog. And you can see over here, does, yeah, can you see the cursor? Yeah, the cursor's working. OK, so I have 23,548 pictures in here. All right? So let's find something in 23,448 pictures. So I go up here. It's called the library filter. And I say text. And so the keyword contains a word. Well, let's find my doggy. Let's look for Linus. There's Linus. How long did that take, folks? Five seconds? Well, let's find some other things here. Let's find I do a lot of, um, a lot of flowers, OK? So there's the word flowers. And you can see lots of flowers pop up. Now, what's interesting is if you look down here, it says there are 629 pictures that have the word flowers. But if I get rid of the S and just say, find all the pictures with the word flower, notice now there are only 690. So this one wants an exact word. Flower is different than flowers. But if I instead say contains instead of contains word, then I get now 1,145 because it's showing the pictures that have the word flower or flowers. So these are the things you're going to get used to as you search for pictures. If you have too many, you might think about whether it's singular or plural, things like that. Um, if any of you do any commercial work, this is where you'd put the name of your client. So I've done a lot of work for a company called RVSI, Robotics Vision Systems. And now these are the, you can see I started with them a, a long time ago. Look at, look at how old this monitor is. Right? But then I've also done some newer things. So I'll show you later on how you can search by date. But I can find anything that I did for RVSI just by typing in their name. Um, if I want, I have a picture I shot of this kid on the beach. I'm trying to find it, but I, I don't remember where it is or, or anything. So it's a kid. I don't know. Let me, let me type in the word child. Let me try that, All right? And so there's child, right? And so. Yeah, this kid's, a, but that's, that's not the right one. Uh, no, that's not it. No, there's a child here. No, that's not it either. Maybe, let me try, let me try some words here. Child contains words. Let me try child and maybe um, water. Let's see what happens. Ah, there it is. That's the one I wanted. Now, the reason these come up is because I put in the keywords. They didn't happen by mistake. But you'll see that you can put the keywords in when you download 472 pictures at once. You just type child water once, and then all the pictures of the child near the water come up together. So it's very, very efficient. And this is the way, even though I shot this picture maybe seven years ago, I was able to find it in two seconds. Um, I've photographed, um, because of my industrial work, I've photographed a lot of x-rays. So there's the x-rays pop up, right? But that's not the one I want. I want I have too many x-rays here. I, I don't want to go through all of these. Look, there are 231. What I'm looking for is I shot some x-rays of food. Oh, that's better. There's all the food. And there's Peapod. So 
So it's that quick to be able to find what I need. Um, and the last thing I'll show you before we get into the nitty gritty, I just want to prove that this thing is really terrific, right? Is, um, as David mentioned, I do a lot of workshops um, in Italy, right? So let's look for Italy. And it says that I have 5,667 pictures of Italy. It's going to be really hard to find the one I want. But I want to find the ones I shot like two years ago. I don't want to look at all the other stuff. I've been here for many, many years. So now I'll go into the metadata. And it says, for the pictures in Italy, I've shot it in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 2016. But I haven't put a lot of the 2016s, and I only have 11 from that year. But I have 1,001 from 2015, 1,391. So it shows me that I, if I just click on 2015, now it's only showing me the pictures from that year. It's only 1,001 instead of what we had before, 1,600. But that's a long year. That's a lot of months, right? So let's look at the ones I shot in October, right? But not on October the whole month. I want to find the ones I shot on Friday, October 2nd. Now they're only 106. And so, yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. So you don't have to type in the date because the date is recorded when you go click. That information is already part of the file. So even though I had 1,600 pictures of Italy, if I remember I just shot it two years ago, then I can, again, narrow it down more and more and more and more. So when people right now, a lot of people keep their pictures by date. And they wind up with hundreds of folders by date. And that's nuts. Because you're not going to remember, as Alzheimer's sets in, <laughs> you're not going to remember what year you went to England or Spain or wherever. So for many of you, it's new. So you have only have two years worth of pictures. So you say the dates work. But mark my word, five years from now, the dates will be a useless system. So are you convinced that it works and you can find stuff, I hope? This is really, really a wonderful system. OK. By, what I also want to show you, by the way, is that all my pictures are in one folder here. It's on my passport. And it's called JPEGs of to print. These are the master files. I made JPEGs out of these. And all 23,000 are in one folder. If you look at lots of other people's Lightroom or other cataloging systems, they have hundreds of folders. All my pictures are in one folder. And people say, how do you find anything? You're going to lose it. How, how do you know where it is? Because the keywords automatically let me find things quickly, and the date is already there. And between the dates and the keywords, I can find anything in 10 seconds. That's how it works. Now, this is my master catalog, and I do not want to mess it up while I'm doing demonstrations. So I am going to open my demonstration catalog instead so I don't do any damage. So we're going to open a catalog here. And we're going to open a different catalog, which is on my computer. That was on a hard drive. And it's called Lightroom for Class. And it's the demo catalog. And I'm going to open up that catalog the master catalog. And see, it says relaunch. So I'm getting rid of this catalog, and I'm going to relaunch the demo catalog. It's asking me if I want to back up my catalog. And I will say skip this time. I only back up when I've made changes, added new pictures, added keywords. Since I haven't done that, I'm going to skip this time. All right, so we've just done that demonstration. All right, And so let me make you feel bad here. Um, this is for you. I'm going to show you that this is a lot better system. Now, by the way, the asterisk is said, yeah, if you don't have a lot of pictures, and if you're not planning on doing this for a long time, then any system works. Because then you can use the folder system with names, or you can use the dates. But this is for the rest of us who are going to be doing digital photography for a very long time. And the problem just gets worse and worse and worser unless you have an organized system for finding your digital files. You know, in the old days, I grew up with slides. You could open up the slide boxes and kind of hold the slide up to the sky and see it. <laughs> you can't do that with a digital file. So here's what the problem is if you don't use something like Lightroom. This is the basic structure of all computers, whether it's Mac or PC. How many people have Macs? All right, so about half and half. So if you have a Mac, you go into Finder, 
right? And then you can click on um, all images. And now it shows you everything that's in your computer that's a picture. And if you click on here, it says that you have more than 10,000 pictures. And you're going to scroll through that long list? I don't think so. So you can turn on the thumbnails. And you can actually click on the thumbnail and make it bigger. But basically, this is what you have. Are you going to be able to find your picture looking at it this way? I don't think so. If you have a PC, it's the same problem. You go into File Explorer, and you click on Pictures. And now you say, well, I was good. I put all my pictures into folders. Well, here's the problem. If you look at, say, um, Girl Scouts, right? So maybe your daughter at 13 years old, you took her picture while she was in her brownie uniform. Do you file that under Jane, her name, or do you file it under Girl Scouts? Well, that's the problem. You can only file it in one place, and you're not going to remember, so you're going to have to open up all those folders. Um, graduation. You have three kids. You photograph them at their high school graduation to college graduation. So you have six sets of pictures. Do you file it under graduation, or do you file it under Jimmy, Mary, and Tom? That's always been the problem we had with film, and it's the same problem with digital. So putting things in folders I don't think is a good idea. OK, so that's the reason why folders, as far as I'm concerned, is useless. So what some people do, they say, no, no, Lester, I'm really structured. You know, I have my hard drive, and it's under my name. And then I have something called photos. And I'm really good because I made a folder for travel. And every time I go to a different place, I'm really good about putting it in separate folders. So you see, I can really find my pictures easily. But family, you know, uh, Jane's wedding, maybe you went with Jane on a cruise. Does it go into Jane's wedding, or does it go in the cruise? I don't know. But it gets more difficult. You have all these graduations. And sometimes it gets even more complicated. You know, so folders as such don't always do the job right. And so what happens is you wind up with folder list that looks like this. So those of you, even in iPhoto, very often you have folders in iPhoto or Picasa. And it, it just gets crazy. Or maybe you've put them in a the folder. Some people say, I'll put it in folders by date. I've run into a lot of people who put it by date. So here's what your date list looks like. And again, that's crazy because you're going to have too many dates. You will not be able to find things that way in a few years. So have I convinced you? Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so that's that. So let's now forget about all that. You're never going to do that again, promise me. So the Lightroom cataloging system is two parts. Part number one is your original files. They reside outside of Lightroom. People say, I'm bringing my pictures into Lightroom. No, you are not. The original camera files are outside of Lightroom on a hard drive, an external hard drive or your computer hard drive. Your files are not in Lightroom. They're there on your hard drive or external drive. So that's the first part. The second part is the Lightroom catalog is actually a database that doesn't store your pictures. It stores information. One of the things it does is it makes a thumbnail from your original file. So what you're seeing in Lightroom is not your original picture, but what they call a preview, or it's a proxy, a stand-in image for your original file. It is not your original picture. It also knows where the original files are. Where on your hard drive or on your external hard drive are the originals? And one of the things that gets people into trouble is that they put them on a hard drive initially, then they move them outside of Lightroom, and Lightroom says, where did they go? So making sure that Lightroom knows where the originals are is very important. It also records automatically, without you doing anything, the camera data, including the date. And then, in the catalog, you can add new metadata, like more keywords, full-length captions, copyright notice, and the tweaking that you do. It turns out, when you crop an image, or you make it greener or more contrasted, you are not affecting the picture. You are actually writing a set of instructions that Lightroom will apply to a copy of your original when you export the picture. Sounds complicated, but that's, again, let me say it again. 
When you adjust the picture in Lightroom, lighter, darker, purple, blue, whatever you do to it, you are not affecting your original picture. That is actually a set of mathematical instructions that Lightroom will apply to a copy of your original when you export it, meaning send it to Facebook, attaching it to an email, making a print. So nothing you do in Lightroom is actually affecting the original photograph. Think of the catalog. Anyone remember these? Anyone old enough to remember these things, right? So you couldn't read the book here. This was the reference. It gave you the title, the author, the publication date, and it told you where it is. So this is the Lightroom catalog, and these are your original files. And it's that analogy that I think is really important to understand. You are never looking at your original picture. Your original photographs are in a hard drive somewhere on your computer. What's neat about the catalog is that in that demonstration I did with 23,000 pictures, the catalog is, um, is, 20, is 443 megabytes of that catalog. The original 23,000 JPEGs takes up 32 gigabytes on my hard drive, but the catalog only takes up a little over 400 megabytes, so the catalog is 72 times smaller than the original photos. And this is why it's easy to find things. You can carry it around. You'll see you don't even need, if you have your files on a hard drive, you can unplug your hard drives, take your computer on vacation, and still see all your pictures. And then you only have a small file on your computer rather than a gazillion gigabytes of the big pictures. As I just said, if your camera files are stored on an external drive, and as we shoot more and more and more, everybody's understanding that you can't keep all the pictures in your computer because it just takes up too much room. So you have them on an external drive. If you unplug your external drive, you'll still be able to see the Lightroom catalog. But you will not be able to develop them. You will not be able to tweak them. You will not be able to export them to email. You will not be able to make a print. But you'll still be able to see all the pictures and show them to people and make a slideshow and plug into a TV uh, screen or um, another laptop. If you make, so there's something in Lightroom called smart preview. And this is a way of bypassing what I just said. You can actually Instead of making a regular preview, which is fairly small, you can tell Lightroom to make a smart preview, which is a bigger file. That way, when you unplug your external drive, you will still be able to take just your laptop with you and edit your pictures, crop, lighten, darken, do all the things you want. So that's called a smart preview. You generally don't do that to all your pictures because then the catalog gets enormous. You might do it to a bunch of pictures for a project you're working on, and you're going to be away for a week, and you just want those 50 pictures to be able to work with completely. So we don't usually make smart previews except for a specific group of photographs. You will be able, though, if you unplug your hard drive, you will be able to add keywords. You'll still be able to organize and make these collections and uh, albums, as people call them. And you can make uh, slide views. The great thing about Lightroom, and I'll say it again, is it's non-destructive. Nothing you do in Lightroom can hurt your original picture, short of deleting it. And when you delete it from the catalog, Lightroom asks you, do you want to delete the picture from your hard drive? It even gives you a choice. So you can crop, you can make it black and white, you can make a tiny JPEG, you can mess around with it all you want. You are not hurting the original file. So that's one of the great things about working with Lightroom. It's totally non-destructive. Someone asked me before we started, if you work in Photoshop and you make a lot of changes and then you hit save, then you're destroying the original file, unless you're working in RAW, because you also can't hurt a RAW file even in Photoshop. So Lightroom never touches your original file. It just works on a copy all the time. What you see in Lightroom, again, is not your original file. So let me show you now some basic navigation uh, around Lightroom, just to show you what it looks like. All right, so I'm going to minimize this now, and we're going to go back into Lightroom and just show you um, what it looks like, just some basic uh, navigation around Lightroom. 
Um, Lightroom has a lot of little triangles all over the place. It's kind of fussy when you want to see things. So on every side, there's a little, you see the triangle in the corner over here? So you can, you can make the screens bigger and smaller from all files if you want. So that's where these little triangles are. Um, you can change the size of the thumbnails. There's a slider here if you want to see a lot of thumbnails or a little bit of th thumbnails. Let me go to all pictures so you can see that better. Right? So you can change the thumbnails. You can get them quite large or you can get them really, really tiny when you're looking for stuff. Lightroom has a number of different views. This is right now, it's called the grid view. That's this little uh, hatch here. It looks like a checkerboard. If you click on a picture um, and you hit the space bar and you click again, you can actually zoom in. Um, that's called the survey, survey view. Uh, or you can go back to the thumbnail. So if you want to see a picture, again, you can either click here. That makes it nice and big. Or you can hit the space bar. And then if you hit escape, you get back to the thumbnails. There's something here called um, survey view. Let's say you have two pictures and you're thinking of using them. And it's very hard when you have a whole bunch of pictures on the screen to decide which one is the most important. So let's say you're trying to decide between um, this one and this one, two accordion players in Venice. Well, over here where it says X, Y, you can put them on the screen side by side and you can get a good feeling of which one you want to see. It's very easy to make a decision when they're side by side. Or maybe, maybe you know what, I think, I don't know, I, I like this one, but I don't think this one's so good. So I can maybe pick another one and say I like this one. So you can keep comparing what you have to this one. Or maybe you can change this one now and say, no, I think I want, I want a different original over here. So it's a great way of looking at pictures once you want to decide which one you want to keep, which one you want to use. If you have more than one, let's go back to the grid view. If you have more than one, you can also, let's say you want to pick on, on three pictures. I have one, two, three. And now the third box over is called the survey view. And so you can look at more than one picture at a time. And you can even add another one if you so desire. Oops, I guess I did that wrong. You've got to click on all of them at the same time. Click. All right, and then go into survey. So that's a way of putting many pictures on the screen. So it's all down here. Um, this is the thumbnail view. This is for looking at one picture. This is for looking at more than one. And this is for looking at a whole bunch. So that's very important uh, in terms of navigation. All right, more things to show you. Um, on the bottom here, you see it says sort by. And there are various ways of sorting. Right now, I have sorted by the file name. But you can also sort by capture time. Basically, it will put the pictures in order that you shot them, because your camera records the date and the time that you shot them. Or you can also sort by the order that you uh, added them into Lightroom, um, or when you edited them. You'll see about ratings and pics. So that's down here. Um, you can sort it by many, many ways, depending on what your needs are at the time. And you can, by the way, you can sort over here. It says sort from A to Z. So you can put the oldest or the newest first. You can put the file name with the lowest number or the highest number. And so you can go from A to Z or Z to A. So that's another little thing that um, Lightroom has. And then another thing that you're going to see, and we'll talk a lot about this later on, is for this picture over here, it's called keyword tags. These are the keywords that I put in for this particular picture. Accordion player along Zatare, that's a, um, a canal in Venice. Europe, Italy, musician, Venice. Those are the words that will help me find the accordion player one day if I'm looking for the pictures of the accordion player in Venice. So this is the keyword box, and we're going to spend a lot of time on that later on. And then another thing is there are the arrows. So if your camera shot a vertical and it didn't straighten it out, you can, uh, wrong button, you can rotate it this way. Right. So there are the rotation arrows. All right, so that's the basic navigation around Lightroom. There are many, many other little buttons. But in two hours, I'm only showing you what I consider the most important ones. <coughs> Now, we're going to show you now about how to import pictures into Lightroom. These are ones that are already there. 
But of course, you got to get them into Lightroom. And again, understand you're not really bringing your pictures into Lightroom. The original pictures reside outside Lightroom. Bringing them into Lightroom really means Lightroom is going to make these preview or proxy images so you can see what your photographs look like. So you go into the import tab over here. Now, there are various ways of importing them. Um, I have, I think that's the uh, USB card. So here's, a, um, I don't know if you can see this, it's a memory card, memory card reader. So on the memory card, if I click up here, see it says source. It, Lightroom is saying, where are the pictures you want to bring into Lightroom? So if I click on that memory card, it shows me all the pictures on that memory card, right? And you can, before you bring them in, they're not in Lightroom yet, it's just showing you what's on the memory card. So you can click on the picture, and you can blow it up, and you can see what you have. So that's handy, and this is where sometimes people will say, this picture is ugly, I hate it, I never want to see it again, and you can uncheck it. And so you see it's grayed out. That picture will not be imported. My recommendation, the way I work, is I import everything, all the junk. Of course, I don't have any bad pictures. But for those of you who, those of you who do, I say get them into Lightroom and spend the time later on deciding which ones you want to keep and which ones you don't. Other people like to look at them here and don't even want to bring them into Lightroom. They just eliminate the real junk right away. I mean, if I see a blank or something totally out of focus, I might delete it here. So this is how you would bring it in if it's on a memory card. And you see up here it says copy. This is very crucial. Copy means that the pictures are still on the memory card and are not on any hard drive either in your computer or external drive. So that definitely you would want copy. You can also copy as a DNG would be to convert your file to the Adobe RAW format, which is DNG, which stands for digital negative. Um, I do not do that. I use Nikon's RAW files or Fuji's RAW files or you have Canon. Some people convert everything to DNG. It's supposed to be a more universal standard that Adobe has been trying to push for years. Most people have not bought into it. You can, you can go online and read the pros and cons of it. Um, it doesn't make a difference in how the picture looks. It's supposedly to future proof it so that if Canon or Nikon goes out of business one year, supposedly the DNG format will still be readable. I don't know if that's going to happen. Anyway, so if you have it on a um, memory card, you say copy as just copy or copy as DNG. In this case, instead, I'm going to pretend I have my pictures already in the computer, which is what a lot of you do. And instead of bringing them in from a memory card, I'm going to bring them into Lightroom from a folder that I have somewhere. And so in B&H Lightroom demonstration, I put some pictures into a folder called Import Demonstration. So these are a bunch of photographs, and I'll show you how to do that. So now, you see instead of copy, it's gone to Add. I want to leave them in my computer and just add them to the catalog. They are not on a memory card, they're on a hard drive somewhere. Believe it or not, I can bring in movies. Do you see this is a video, it says MOV here, and this is also a movie, I'll bring that in a little later. And these are all, um, I made JPEGs just so things will go faster. I normally shoot RAW, but you can certainly bring in your JPEG or RAW or both into Lightroom. I made JPEGs again for the speed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import just the JPEG, so I'm turning off the movies right now. And now I want to bring these in. Now, this is the important thing. Don't import suspected duplicates. Keep that checked, that's very important, so you don't have the same picture in the catalog six times. This is the key to everything. This is where you add the keywords. All right, let me make the thumbnails a little larger. I guess it's, well, that's as big as they're gonna get. There is something usually similar about the whole batch. And this is where you add those similar keywords. Something is similar about the batch. Add as many as you can. This idea that, oh, I'll remember. No, you will not remember. Put it down now. So, class, what keywords should we add to this group of pictures? Well, I'm going to disagree. Why will I not use the word bridge? 
Because it's not in every one. Okay. Outdoors. Okay, outdoors. Very good. London. Somebody said London, right? These are all in London. Um, all right, dusk, evening, uh, let's, we'll put both words in. Always put lots of words. Dusk is fine. Evening? All right, what else? The river. Very good. No, there's some verticals. Sorry. Cityscape. I use the word cityscape, absolutely. For my stock pictures, I have landscape, cityscape, seascape. Now, question. This is, this is a quiz. You may not know the answer. Where is London? Seriously, right? Where else is it? What else do we call it? Someone said England. Very good. And I always use Europe because I travel all over the place. You see how many words you can generate? People say, oh, yeah, I just shot those at night in London. No, you got to put all this stuff in because you're going to have a lot of pictures in the future. We can't use bridge because they're not all bridge. But they're all done in the evening. They're all on the Thames River. By the way, it's not the Thames. Those British people talk funny, and they call it the Thames. They spell it Thames. Um, so I think that's all for these. Now, we will add specific keywords to some of them later on, where we want bridge because they're not all bridge or the Tower of London, things like that we'll add later on. But at least by adding these keywords, when I bring them in, I've done the one thing that will help me find them in the future, and I've got um, 24 photos. I only had to type the words once. It's that simple. The other thing I do is it asks me where I want to keep them or move them, but in this case, they're in a folder, and Lightroom will know that they're in this folder. I could move them, if I clicked on move instead, then I could move them out of, out of this folder into my master folder. So I could move it here into, I'll show you if I want, I could move it into a folder called Lightroom for Class, and I could move them into Lightroom Original Big Files. That's the one folder I have in Lightroom for this catalog. So I could take them out of that temporary folder, and move them into my master folder. That master folder just gets getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, you empty up all these silly little folders that you have all over your computer. And they wind up in one big folder. That's the way I work, and I get rid of all these little folders. But because I want to keep this for demonstration, I'm actually going to leave it there instead of moving it into my master folder. And so that's it. It says, where do you want to take them from? Do I want all or some of them? What are the keywords that are germane to these pictures? Where are you going to put them? And I'm ready to rock and roll. So I click on the button that says import, like that. And see, you can see the, the space bar up here. And now it's generating um, all the thumbnails that I need. But you can continue to work in the background. So now, these pictures are now, quote, in Lightroom. These are here. They're still in that other folder because I left them there and Lightroom knows where they are, or they'd still be on the memory card. It doesn't take them off the memory card. They're still on the card, but Lightroom knows where I put them. It's important. It remembers where are the master pictures. Now, if I go to all photographs, oh, they went away. No problem because I go to previous import, which is usually the ones you want to work on now. So now, if I want, now I can start adding more keywords. So now, now we have uh, the pictures that we brought in, and now we're going to add a few more keywords because bridge was not appropriate in all cases. And this is show you how you can do things quickly. I could click on this picture, and I could add the word bridge. Type here bridge. By the way, what kind of bridge is it? It's called tower bridge. All right. But that's silly because then I have to type it here and here, and in here, and here. So the way you do things efficiently in Lightroom is you click on all the pictures that need the same thing done to it. So I click on the first one and hold down Control or Command if you're a Mac person. And I click on this one. And I find all the other tower bridges here, and here, and here. And we'll see if there are any more. 
This is Tower Bridge, and this is Tower Bridge in the background. All right, so now I've selected um, a bunch of pictures, 10 of them out of the 24, and all 10 get the same word. I only have to type it once. So if I type, watch, if I type bridge, watch what happens. BR, as soon as I type BR, autofill came up, which is a way you save time and spelling errors. So since I had used the word bridge before, bridge came up, and I just hit enter. And now I want to type tower bridge. See, tower bridge came up again. So it's a way of adding keywords, these are so-called sub-keywords, to all my pictures because they didn't all fit the overall import word. Now, um, there are some others that I want to add. This is, anyone know what this is? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it again. Anyone recognize this? The Tower, Tower of London, very good. So I'll click on this one and this one. And again, I'm holding down Control. And this is not the tower. Here's the Tower of London. And are there any others? Um, I shot it, I think, from across the water. Yep, here it is again. And we're all set. So I just type in here, oh, it's comma, and then Tower of London. Now, all of those six have the word Tower of London. It's that simple. The question is, do these words stick to the original picture? And that's a very important question. Because while you're working in Lightroom, you don't care. But what if, God forbid, you lose the Lightroom catalog and 20 years of keywording? What you want is the keywords to be stuck back to the original files. That's really, really important. And I'm going to show you in a few slides later where you set Lightroom to tell Lightroom to make sure that these words are not just in Lightroom, but they're appended to your original file. That's really, really important to do. And you may never see a problem until one day if you lose, God forbid, the Lightroom catalog, you will not have to redo all the keywording because the keywords will be attached already to all the pictures. All right, and then, so that's it. So that's how you add keywords, either to groups of them or to random ones. And it's very, very important to have these. So let's say now we go to all photographs, right? And we want to find, um, we're now looking at uh, 1,400 pictures here, right? 1,400 pictures, and now, two years later, I want to find the pictures of the Tower of London. So I go to keyword, contain tower, and there they are, right? They came up just like that. So uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful system. If I go back to previous import, um, these all come up. Now, let me, let me go back real quick just to show you. You know, lots of you now have cameras that shoot video, right? How many people shoot video? Anybody? Two people, right? Hooray. Let me just show you something here, just for fun, right? If you go to import them, remember I didn't import these two? And you see, by the way, Lightroom knows that all the others have been imported. It doesn't show me, it only shows me the new ones and these two. These two uh, videos haven't been imported. So I can import these two also. I can add it to the same catalog, and I can import them. Right. And watch. Pretty cool, huh? Right. Here's another one. It's not, this is not as exciting. This is more, more bucolic. This is in Ireland last year. So if you shoot videos, you, you can use Lightroom. And you can see, just as you adjust a still picture, lighter, darker, you can do the same thing in Lightroom to video. So you don't need any separate program to do your basic in and out uh, and adjustment editing in uh, Lightroom. If we have time, I'll show you how you can do that with videos, too. So let's go back to PowerPoint, and we did basic navigating. And this will just reiterate um, what we've done before. All right, so remember, copy is what you use to pull files from your memory card. Add leaves the files where they are in many folders that you have and duplicates those folders in Lightroom. Move takes them from one folder on your computer, and maybe you've made a new folder called all the master pictures. 
and so it will move them out, and that's the way you get rid of all your folders. Eventually, you'll just have one folder like I do, and you'll get rid of all those folders with names on them. What you can do is if you have pictures in folders with names, those folder names can be the keywords to that bunch of pictures. So one at a time, you empty out the folder, give it the folder name as a keyword, bring it into Lightroom, put it in one master folder, and that makes your life a lot cleaner and simpler. So you can either download um, right from the camera, or you can download from the memory card. Those of you who are using things like Photo or Picasa now, um, you may find that every time you plug in the camera or memory card, Picasa or Photo opens up, and you want Lightroom. So you'll have to go into that software under Preferences, usually, and turn off the automatic importing so that it doesn't fight with Lightroom. You do not want pictures in two different catalogs. You will go crazy. So again, to reiterate, you're going to download directly into Lightroom, and you're going to be good boys and girls and add the basic keywords. And if you want, I didn't show you this, but in the import screen, there's something that says, would you like Lightroom to make a second copy of the original on an external hard drive? So if you're downloading from the memory card, it can put the files in your computer and at the same time make a backup copy on an external drive if that's the way you want to work to be secure in your pictures. And that's certainly recommended if you care about possible catastrophes in the future. So we did the uh, importing. And we talked about keywording. Again, to reiterate about the keywords, the camera doesn't make picture. It makes data, believe it or not. And we've created a searchable database to find the images. That's a, that's a real quote. She did say that. I heard her dur during the campaign. She she no. No. <laughs> uh, All right. But that's true. We're going to use keywords to find things, just like you use Google today, right? And so embedded in your click is metadata, right? And when you go click, the camera creates what's called EXIF metadata. And these are the things that you don't have to type in because the camera creates it. It creates the camera type, the focal length, the aperture, the shutter speed, the ISO, the date and time, so you don't have to type that in white balance, flash, all that kind of stuff is already there. You do not have to use it as keywords. Some cameras create optional data. If your camera records GPS, um, copyright, maybe the camera serial number, there's some special things that some cameras also record. And then you have to add copyright notice if you want. You can write a whole caption, not only keywords, but I'll show you later, you can write a whole story under the pictures, not just a few keywords. Um, you may want to put your contact information if you send the pictures out, um, GPS location, and of course the most important thing that you are going to add are the keywords. Now, question that we had here, this is important. If you go into Lightroom, into the catalog settings, under the metadata tab, you want to make sure the box is checked, automatically write changes into XMP. This guarantees that when you type keywords in Lightroom, it glues it into the master files that are residing outside of Lightroom. So if you ever lose the Lightroom catalog, all your pictures with all the keywords are still intact. And the worst case is you get a new copy of Lightroom, suck them all into Lightroom again, but the keywords would already be there, and all those years of keywording would not be lost. I don't know why on many copies of Lightroom this is unchecked. I think that should be a crime. But if you go into Catalog Settings, under Metadata, make sure it says Automatically Write Changes into XMP. All right? If you didn't do that, let me, let me, uh, if you didn't do that and you have pictures in Lightroom, I'll show you what to do because it's very important. You go into Lightroom. And you can highlight all the photographs. So you have to say edit, select all, and then you go to metadata. And it says, save metadata to file. Now, the reason it's grayed out is all my metadata has been saved to file. So if you have pictures in Lightroom and you're worried about making sure that these keywords stick to your pictures, highlight them all 
and go to metadata, save, metadata to file, and then you're good for the rest of your life. Let's go back to PowerPoint here now. All right. So on a, on a Mac, it's under Lightroom, Catalog Settings, Metadata. On a PC, it's under Edit instead of under Lightroom. So keyword step number one is you don't have to worry because Lightroom records all the settings. If you travel, I think it's really helpful to change the date and time. You don't have to do that. It, just, it, it may be wrong when you get home. Downloading, you're going to batch keyword something that's germane to all that batch. It's not funny. <laughs> so remember, these are the basic keywords you're going to ask, answer or plug in, right? You don't put in the date. So many people type in the date. You don't have to because the date is already there in the metadata. And then put in some keywords. Don't use complex uh, bunch of words. Separate them by comma. Um, don't use abbreviations. I strongly recommend use complete spellings because you're going to forget the abbreviations you used. If you do commercial work, as I do, I put in all these things also so I can find my client jobs. If I am lucky enough to have lots of client jobs, then I'll be able to access them whenever I want. More things than once you bring them into Lightroom, add lots of keywords and make sure that you spell accurately. All right, so that's my recommendation. All right. So we did that. We showed how we added Tower Bridge and Bridge yeah. two pictures once they were already in Lightroom. So these were the main ones before we brought them in, and then you can add sub keywords once they're there. But at least do the main words first. That's very important. All right, that's how it goes. You can have compound words like that. It's okay. They're not case sensitive. The spelling's a problem. So use the autofill. Use that. And you'll see if we get to it, there's, um, you can make a set of nine words that you use a lot. Let's say your family's the kids' names, that you use those names over and over. So there's a little box on the side. You can put nine words in there that you use over and over. And you can change those nine words. Like if you go to Europe and you come back and you need Paris, Eiffel Tower, blah, 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 you can change those nine words. You just have to click on them rather than typing them. So it's another way of making things very, very efficient. Right? So let me show you now um, some more information on keywording and uh, EXIF information. For example, it tells us that this picture, if we go down here on the right side, these, by the way, these, this is the keyword list. These are all the keywords that I've used. If I want to click on the word academia and click on that, there are eight pictures, and these are from the Academia Bridge in Venice. So it shows you which pictures. The actor is my friend Neil. So it shows you which pictures uh, that you've used the keyword airplane comes up like that. So that's another way of finding keywords. But I was about to show you the uh, EXIF information here. So let's turn this off and say none. So if we want to see um, this picture that I took um, last year of Andrea with the cows, right, I scroll down here now to metadata, right? And you can see it says EXIF. And it tells me that that picture is um, 2000 by 1333. It's a JPEG um, I made from the original RAW. I shot it on September 20th in 2016 at 11, 10, and 24 seconds in the morning. I shot it at 1 30th of a second at f13, uh, 200 millimeters on my lens. Uh, in 35 millimeter, that's equivalent to 30, 300 millimeters. Uh, what the brightness, the, the ISO 200, the flash did not fire. And I shot it with a Fuji X-T2, whose serial number is that, with a 55 to 200 millimeter lens. You got that? Yeah. <laughs> and that's all recorded when I go click. I did not have to add that. It's all there, very, very helpful. So that's the EXIF information. Um, and if you um, are a photojournalist, there's all sorts of other information that you can add. It's called IPTC information, and that is um, for mostly photojournalists. It's the who, what, when, where, and why caption 
who the author was, who wrote it, where the contact information is, where you live, where they send the check, who your publisher is, all that kind of stuff. So photojournalists use this a lot when they're out in the field. And again, they just have to type it in once for all the pictures they took that day. So that's called IPTC. Most of you will just be using the EXIF information here. And if you want, you can also, since we're here, it says large caption. This is where you can write a story. So besides the keywords, you can write a story. Anyway, you get the point, right? <laughs> so, and you can search on these words. So again, for people doing projects where you need more than keywords, you can put all sorts of caption information that you can then search on just like you search on keywords. So for people doing projects or poetry or you want to send this to somebody and have them read your caption, you can also in the EXIF information or in the uh, metadata, you can type in entire captions. I'm going to delete that. Okay. So that's where you put large captions as opposed to EXIF information. So there's the EXIF information. All right. I think, I think we're done now with that stuff. Now we're going to talk about using Lightroom to organize your life. So many ways of um, organizing things. You want to start selecting pictures, right? Let's go to all photographs, and let's go to none, and let's sort this by file name from A to Z. All right, so we're back in business here. And let's say I want to start picking out some pictures that I really hate. There's a good chance I'm going to throw them away. Well, here's one thing. You can click on a picture, and if you hit the delete key, it says, well, this is, you know, I, I shouldn't have used this one. Don't ask me why. I'm changing my mind. I've got to find a different one. Um, this one. Let's say, let's say this one you want to get rid of. And if you hit the delete key, Lightroom says two things. Do you want to remove it from the file in Lightroom, from the Lightroom catalog, but still keep the master file on the hard drive? The trouble with doing that is if you remove it from Lightroom, you'll never see it again, and you won't know it's there. So my recommendation is if you're going to delete it, just get rid of it. You'll never see it again, and so I usually just delete it from the hard drive. So if you hit the delete key, I usually select delete from disk, and that's the end of it. It's gone. All right. So that's what I do. But let's say you're not sure right now of what you want to delete. So one of the things you can do is you can give it the black flag treatment. All right, so down here, you see it says set as reject. It's called rejected. It's kind of sad. So you can reject that picture. And you see there's a little black flag here? And then maybe you can reject, um, I don't know, maybe you don't like this picture. Right? So you can reject that picture. You can also reject a bunch at once. So you can click on this sand dune, and this sand dune, and this sand dune, and you can reject them all at once. And so they're all rejected. Now you want to go back and start picking the good ones. right? So you say, well, I like this one. And now instead of a black flag, you give it a white flag. See the white flag up here? And maybe you like this guy, so you give that a white flag. And you come over here, and you give this a white flag. And you come over here and give this a white flag. And you say, I really, see, by the way, see it's grayed out? Because it's got a black flag. And you give this one a white flag. And you give this one a white flag. So now, notice that the um, rejected pictures are grayed out. So now I got them. I randomly picked the good ones, the bad ones. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort them the way I want to see the ones I've just picked. So we go down here. Instead of sorting by file name, I'm going to sort by pick. And now, if I scroll up here, all the ones, you notice all the ones with the white flags are together. And so now I've got a little group. Now I say, now nah, you know what? I don't really want that one. I'll click on it, and now the flag is gone. But I do, I do want to add this one. And so this one will pop back up into the group that's been sorted by picks. So this is another way of starting to group all the stuff that you have instead of having millions of pictures all over the place. Um, if I want to um, reject all of these together, I can individually click. But it's much easier to click on the first one, hold down Shift, click on the second one, and then just click on any white flag. And now they're all unflagged 
and now they're gone. So you can flag them, unflag, flag them, unflag as much as you want. If I want to see all the rejects, I go up here to attribute, and here's the symbol for the, um, what happened to the black flags? Here, there it is, right? So these are all the ones that have the black flags. So if I, before I decide I really want to trash these, I can just see those and not be bothered by them getting in my way. So that's, that's very helpful. So we'll put these back, though, into the system, and we'll get rid of the black flags. So now they're all loved again. Now, here's another problem. Look at these pictures. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are from a high-speed ferry I took to New Jersey a few weeks ago. And there's a lot of them here, but I don't want to deal with them now. I just want to make a little pile, and I'll get back to them later on. So here's a very cool thing. You click on the first one, and you click on the second one. And then you go to Photos on the top, and it says, um, if I can find it because I usually do it, what is it? Stacking. Go to stacking, right? And it says, group into stack. Watch. One, two, three, go. Where did they go? They're all gone. There's only one picture here. You see the number eight? It indicates that there are eight more pictures here. But they're kind of out of my field of view for a while until I need to go there. If I click on the button, then they all come back to life. Or click on the button again, and they're all a stack. So that's another way, again, of starting to make piles and getting rid of stuff that you don't need. Or I can go to um, stack and unstack them also here. And now they all come back. More ways of grouping things. You can also set up a hierarchy of your pictures. So let me, let me click on this one and get rid of that. So there are star ratings, right? Uh, the good ones, the great ones, the almost ones, the terrible ones. So you can go through the pictures. And you can say, well, this one, I want to give one star. Now, there are stars down here. They're little tiny buttons. They're kind of hard to see. So you can just click the numbers. So this gets one star. And then if I click the number three here, this gets three stars. And this one gets five stars. You can, you know, it's just in your head as to what the hierarchy is of which ones you want to use. And this one gets five stars also. And this one gets two stars. And this one gets one star. And now you can sort them by the rating. The stars are called ratings. And now if I go to the top, you'll see that the five stars are here, the three stars, and the two stars. So it's another way of grouping your pictures to start organizing them into some system where you want to do something. These are the ones I want to work on. These are the ones I hate. These are the ones I want to send to grandma, whatever you want to do. How do you unstar them? So you can highlight them all and just hit 0. And then all the stars go away. Or you can individually highlight a picture and type 0 and make the stars appear or disappear. So it's a very fast way of starting to pick out the good ones that you want. Another way, there's many ways of doing things in Lightroom, is you can also add color borders. So you can say that this one um, gets a red border. And this one also gets a red border. And this one gets a uh, green border because it's only a maybe. And this is one I want to make a print of. I'll give that a blue border. And this one, uh, I like purple. And so again, you can make a hierarchy of the pictures. And then instead of sorting them by ratings, you're going to sort them by label color. And so now if you go to the top, they're all sorted, the red ones, the green ones, the blue ones. Another way of organizing your stuff and finding the good ones you want. Or maybe to add keywords. Maybe you say all the red ones need a certain keyword in the future. So it's a way of grouping them. Or again, to get rid of the lab color labels, I can highlight them all, hold down Shift, um, and go all the way down here. And I'll go to Label, Label Color, and go to None. And now all the label colors are gone. So that's what we did with label colors. And the last thing before we go into tweaking the pictures is now that you've organized some stuff, you want to put them into a folder, so to speak. And it's not a real folder. It's a temporary folder in Lightroom. It's not a traditional computer folder. So we go, let's say we're going to do a bunch of pictures of Linus. All right? So we click on the pictures of Linus here. And we go here, and it's called a collection. And we click on plus, and it says create a collection. And we're going to call it Linus. 
the caps lock is on here. Now watch, and I say create. Now, there's a folder here with Linus. So when I look at all the pictures, instead of searching for Linus again, if I'm going to do a book on Linus, I just scroll down here, and I have a collection called Linus, and they just pop up like that instantaneously. So this is where photographers start working on their pictures. These are the ones I have to send to a client. These are the ones I'm going to submit for the Pulitzer Prize. These are the ones I'm going to make a calendar out of. And this is exactly what people do all the time with their pictures. They make these little collections that save you search time. And the beauty is you can add and subtract whenever you want. So if you are looking at all your photographs, right, and then you decide um, just for fun, of course, this is not the case. But let's say um, this is another picture of Linus you forgot to put in. So you can drag this picture into the Linus folder, and now it shows up with the other pictures of Linus. Or you can say, no, that was stupid, and you just hit the delete key. It doesn't delete the folder. It just deletes the picture from that grouping. So you can drag in whatever you want, take it out, drag it in. It's very, very helpful. And this is the way when I'm putting a lecture together. This is what I do, how I group my pictures into the type of photographs that I want to make a particular point. So the collections are very, very important. And it's real simple. You, you can either make the collection first by just clicking on the word collection and then drag pictures into it, or you can highlight a bunch of pictures, then click on the collection and give it a name, and all those pictures go into the collection. You can move more in. You can take them out back and forth. It's very, very handy. And usually you do that first by flagging some or starring them. That's your basic collection. Then you can add more later as you say, oh, yeah, I should have done this. I should have done that. If you, if you delete a picture from a collection, it's still in Lightroom under all the 4,000 pictures. It's just not in the collection folder. That's the only difference. So that's the collection. Now let's get into developing. You want to tweak your great pictures, right? So let's, let's go into, we did the organizing, we did the hierarchy, we did that. So now we're going to go into the develop module, right? And this is what our next job is. Is a great quote. For those of you who know the darkroom, dodging and burning is what we used to do in the old days to lighten and darken different parts of the picture. Now, of course, we have much more control. Um, I love this Ansel Adams example. The picture on the left is the original. The picture on the right is his final one. So this is what the original negative looked like. And this is his most famous picture after he got done with it in the darkroom. So even Ansel Adams was doing a lot of, quote, manipulation to bring out the beauty and the wonderfulness of his pictures. So in the develop module, we can do the overall, which is things like color balance, exposure, contrast, highlights and shadows, whites and blacks, and we can even adjust individual colors if we like. Then I'll show you how you can work on a local area, but we always do the overall first. And so there are brushes to do that. There's something called gradients, where you can add a change in a tapered fashion. You can do spotting. You can even tone the pictures. And then there's some special stuff. You can convert your color to black and white in a very sophisticated way, sharpen your pictures. You can reduce noise if you shot at high ISO. You can correct perspective when you shoot at buildings and they look like they're falling over. You can straighten them out. And you can even do some cloning to get rid of things that shouldn't be there. It's not the most powerful cloning tool. Photoshop is far better, but you can do some basic stuff in Lightroom. So let's do a demonstration in um, Lightroom of developing. And so I have, you see, I've put some pictures into collections here. And the first one is called basic tweaking. I've moved some pictures from my catalog. There are 11 of them in here. And we'll do basic tweaking. The first thing is you go into the develop module, which is up here. So we're done with library. We're going into develop. This is a different module, going into develop. And on the right side here are all the basic sliders. And the beauty of this is it's all visual, and you can't hurt anything. So screw around, fool around, try stuff. You can't hurt anything. No matter what you do, you're never affecting the original picture. And you'll see you can always reset and start all over again. No damage done. So. These are the white, so-called white balance, where you can make the picture from the, you can make it more yellow, 
or you can make it more neutral. This is the yellow blue slider. There's also a green magenta. You see, it shifts. So this is where you do your basic color correction. If you shot on a cloudy day, which is bluish, if you shot under fluorescent lights, which are green, um, if you shot in the shade, which is very blue, this is the way you do the overall color correction to your photograph. Exposure is how bright or dark it is. If you slightly over or underexposed, you can correct it here. So you can make it darker or you can make it lighter. Contrast means you make it zippier or you can make it flatter. Highlights are the light tones. You can bring them down or boost them up. Shadows are the darker tones. You can make them darker or lighter. Um, if your picture has some whites, you can adjust that. Or if it has some blacks, you can make the blacks more intense or lighter. Um, one of the tricks, by the way, if you want to bring the sliders back to zero, you just double click on the name. You double click on the name. There you go. And it goes back to zero. And also, what I didn't show you is if anything that you've done, you hit reset, and it brings the picture back to what it was. So no matter what you do, you can always go back and do things. All right, um, let's look at this one. Here's a typical picture. All right, so we're in the develop module. What do we want to do with this? Maybe you like it. I think we could make it better. I think that the shadows are a little dark. So I'll go into the shadows, and I'll lighten up the shadows. You see what that's doing? Can you see that, right? All right, so I'm lightening up the shadows. Um, it's a little flat. I'm going to go into something called um, clarity, which gives the midtones a little contrast. Again, you see that little bit? A vibrance is going to add a little bit of a saturation. I can go too far. That looks silly. But I'm going to add a little bit of vibrance there. And I think that's, that's a little improvement. And to answer your question, the before and after, it's the backslash key. There's the before. There's the after. <laughs> yep, it's that simple. It's, it's the backslash key before. Now, if you want, you can also go here. If you want to see what you've done down here, you can see the side by side. Um, there you go. There's, there it is side by side. You can also see it that way if you'd like. It's down here. Right? Now, if you don't like what you did, if you did something really dumb and you don't know how to get out of it, you just hit the reset key and you start all over. No problem. Um, let's go to another one here. So let's do this one. Um, what do you think of this picture? I took it. Be careful what you say. Someone says it's too dark. I'm insulted. All right? So that's the shadows, right? We'll lighten up the shadows. Look at that. Magic. Now, especially if you shot RAW, there's a lot of information, although there's some if you shot JPEG. I think the highlights are a little washed out. We can do that. It's early in the morning. I want to warm it up a little bit so we can make it a little bit, little bit more yellow. So again, here's the before, and there's the after. That took me, what, 20 seconds to do? If you want to go back in history, these are the steps that I've done here. All right? I changed the shot. So if I want to go back and say I didn't like the way I warmed up the picture, I can go back one step, and that's where I adjusted the highlights, and this is where I adjusted the shadows. All right? So you can, go, you can go back and forth here if you want to do that. So if you mess up, you can go back a few steps. Sometimes when you get really exasperated, the best thing to do is just reset and start all over. So that's that. Let's look at um, this one. Here's another one. This requires something different. What do you think of my great photograph? Gorgeous. Gorgeous, thank you. But what else? What can we do to fix it? The tower is washed out. That's called a highlight. So we'll move the highlight slider. Look at the difference. Look how we bring that tower back to, back to life. All right. Well, it's a little too light overall. I'm going to darken it. Someone said clarity. All right. So clarity just gives a little mid-tone contrast, a little zip there. Right. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little dark down here. So we're going to open up the shadows a little bit so you can see the people down there. And again, before and after. Piece of cake. It's all visual. Just like that. See that? It's very, very simple to do. Or you can hit reset, click, get rid of the history, and start all over again. Um, let's look at some um, other things to do. Let's go into a collection called Crop and Rotate instead. All right? So here's a picture I took. And it's uh, crooked. Uh, we had the camera on the floor. And it's tilted up. So in the Develop module, I can go to the um, Cropping Rotating tool. 
and a grid comes up, and I can try to straighten it out a little bit, which helps a little bit, and then you hit. This is one of the few places, by the way, you notice there was no save on anything I did before. There is no save in Lightroom. It drives people crazy. You don't have to save anything. It just stays there. It's OK. And then I decide I want to crop this. Again, after I straightened it out, I can go into the crop tools like that. And then you can do done or hit enter. And now the picture's done. And then you put it aside. You come back to it a year from now and say, oh, I never should have done that. You can go back to reset and bring it all back to life, and you haven't done any damage. Um, also, here's another one where I think it could definitely benefit from some cropping. So we'll go in here, and we'll get rid of the alleyway here, and we'll strengthen the picture this way like that. And so here's the before. Oh, in crop, you don't see the before and after. That's right. It's annoying. But anyway, it's cropped, and it's a lot better. I get, oh, you can go back to here. There you go. You can do it this way. So that's where a little cropping does wonders. Right? And again, we'll reset that one, and we'll go back to get rid of the history. Um, if you go into the cropping tool over here, you see it has the aspect that says original. You can set all the stuff to make sure you keep the ratio or not. So that's in the cropping tool. That's one of the submenus. Um, next thing is under. Uh, hue, saturation, and lightness. So I have a collection for hue, saturation, and lightness. So if you want to go to this picture here, um, where's the basics down here? So you can increase the saturation overall by cranking it up. What do you think happens if I reduce the saturation more and more and more and more and more? It becomes black and white. That's zero saturation or here. It looks like Disney World. So that's what saturation means. One of the cool things you can do is you can um, attack individual colors. So if I, if I go down here to HSL, Hue, Saturation, and Luminance, I can go to the saturation of just the reds and watch. I can decrease the saturation of the reds or increase. And it's not affecting any of the other colors. It's just working on the reds. So I can make the red almost gray or I can goose it up. I can also change the hue, the color of the reds, and I can make it more orange or more magenta. So the software is so cool, you can adjust individual colors without having to make any individual masks. So that works out very, very well. So that's hue and saturation. Um, selective color. Let's go to selective color. What do we have here? All right, here's another example of the same thing that I just did. Um, let's say I decide that I don't like this yellow area here. So I go into the saturation of the yellow and turn down the yellow so it doesn't look so, or I can crank it up. So you can see it only affects the yellow without affecting the whole rest of the picture. So it's a very, very powerful tool. If somebody's skin is too ruddy or not ruddy enough, you can add some color to their clothing. You can make the sky. Sometimes skies come out cyan. You can take some of the green out. Um, the selective color is very, very powerful. Um, if we wanted to go into white balance, for example, here's the white balance example. This was shot late in the afternoon after sunset. It's what they call the blue hour. But I wanted to make it look more like it was just at sunset, and I want to warm it up. So I go up here to the blue-yellow slider, and I can make a very, very warm rendition, turn down the brightness a little bit, and increase the vibrance and the clarity, and have a nice evening picture like that. So here's the before, before and after. Again, just moving the sliders, whatever floats your boat, whatever you like. You know in the end, you know what the hard part is? Deciding what you want. That's the hard part. Now, something very cool, let me do this now. And that is, let's say you can't make up your mind what you want to do. Right? You just, one of those days, you just can't make up your mind. So what you do is you can make what's called a virtual copy. So you can go to photo make virtual copy to save time, I'm going to uh, right click 
and um, create virtual copy. Right? You see down here, I have two copies now of the same one. In fact, I'm going to make a third one. Uh, create virtual copy. OK, now I have the original and two copies. They look the same. This is not making extra copies of the original file. This is basically three different sets of instructions that could be applied to a copy of the original file when I export. So this one will keep original. This one, we're going to go back and we're going to make it uh, the sunset picture. So we're going to make it nice and warm. We're going to turn down the exposure. And I'll do that quick for now. And this one, you know what? Let's make it black and white. What the heck? So now I have three copies. And I'm going to add a little contrast to that to make it look a little richer. So now I have three copies. One, two, three. And each of those is perfectly valid. If I want to send somebody a black and white picture, I send them this copy. And it will apply the black and white instructions to a copy of my original file and export it, email it, whatever. If I decide I want to send them this one, also OK. So I'm not increasing the size of my stored files, but I'm giving myself choices because I can't make up my mind. And I make variations. This is very, very helpful um, for lots of photographers. If I do client work, clients can never make up their mind. So this way, I give them choices. And this way, it doesn't cost me anything, so to speak, in terms of storage or working with bigger files. So that's where um, virtual copies are a very, very powerful tool. So that's the overall working and develop module. Um, let's work with brushes, because that's a new technique that you didn't have before. Um, I want to get into brushes. And I have some pictures in my folder called brushes. And let's look at this one. Now, if we adjust this picture here, um, it's a little washed out in the highlights, so we can turn those down. And we can give it a little um, clarity to get some mid-tone contrast, and maybe turn down the exposure a little bit. So that's certainly a lot better than it was. But I want to darken the sky even a little more. So now Lightroom has brushes. This symbol here is called the adjustment brush. And if you click on that, you'll get a different set of menus because Lightroom cannot apply the brushes to all of the features in the develop module, but the important ones. So I go into turning on the overlay. You'll see you're going to see some white, I'm sorry, some red overlay which shows where things will happen. And I'm going to get a new brush. And I'm going to go down here. And I'm going to adjust the size of the brush, I'll make it a little bigger. And I'm going to turn on Auto Mask. Auto Mask will allow the brush to find the edge of the picture in relation to the mountains and automatically just make things happen in the sky and automatically mask the edge of the mountain. It's called auto mask. It's pretty cool. It does a pretty good job. And so where I'm painting red is where something, that something is what I will define, is going to happen. And so now I turn off the masking color. And now I go into here. And in just the sky, I can turn down the exposure. And you see how it adjusts just the sky? And I can make it a little contrasty. There and now I have a much stronger sky by using the brush and just there. And you notice it did not hurt anything else. I can go with a new brush. And let's say I want to uh, make the field here a little darker. I'm going to make the brush a little bigger. Wrong button. Make the brush a little bigger. And now I'm going to paint some mask over this area here. Because I want to put the emphasis on the foreground. So I'm going to do this very quickly and very sloppily, but you get the idea. And so now over here, turn this off. And I'm going to go and make that a little darker there. And so now that puts the emphasis on the foreground. So you can use the brushes, and you can zoom in if you want to work carefully. Again, we don't have time to go into the nitty gritty, but it's one more tool that's available to you that you never had in Lightroom before. So it's a great way of starting to work on parts of your pictures, what Ansel Adams called dodging and burning. It's a very powerful tool. Um, You've got to practice with it. There are lots of tutorials online on how to work with brushes. Very important. Now, given the limited time, um, I do want to get into exporting. We couldn't do everything. 
Um, you can make a slideshow, and I will just show you the things that you can do because I made this fun slideshow here to show you what's possible. And that was done in the uh, sun. I made a sunset slideshow. You can take a group of pictures, put them in a collection, and then tell Lightroom to make a slideshow out of it. So here's my modest example over here. So all the zooming and panning that's done automatically in Lightroom, the captions obviously you have to add by yourself, but you can then export this as an MP3 file and you can share it with friends uh, on uh, YouTube and Vimeo, you can email it to your friends, or you can plug into somebody's TV set at home and run your slideshow that way. So it's another powerful feature in Lightroom. And I'm going to ex that's the last thing I'm going to do is export because that's important in the last, last few minutes we have. because. You have all this stuff, There's, I didn't get into the, the print module, but in the print module, you can, let me find another picture here, you can do all sorts of stuff, you can adjust where the image um, fits on the page, how big it is, you can put multiple images on the page, you can change the color of the background, you can stroke it, you can put a little black line around it, you can change the background. Um, so if you want to make prints, this is how you do it, and you can put uh, the copyright notice, for example, I have my copyright in here, so it's uh, watermarking, you can put a watermark on there, and there's my copyright notice on the picture. So you can do all of that, so when you export it, um, you can put your name on it, you can put a title, you can put a caption, that's all available here on the right side on this panel. So the last thing is now, let's talk about if you made a slideshow, if you have pictures, if you made a print, um, if you want to make a book, how do you get it out of Lightroom somewhere? You want to send it to your friends, you want to upload it to your social media site. Well, if we go back to the library, way down here on the left side, it says Publish Services. So if you want to put it on Facebook, this is where you set up your, your Facebook account. And while Lightroom only shows Facebook and Flickr, you can click on here, it says For More Services. So uh, you can go to Instagram or any other place where you have an account and want to post your pictures. So you just highlight the pictures you want, and then you can publish it on Facebook or Pinterest or anywhere else you want. If you want to email your pictures, let's say we go through here, all photographs, and we want to email um, this one and this one and um, this one, you now go to export because you're getting the pictures out of here. And when you export, Lightroom will apply the tweaks that you've made, the cropping, the color, the captions, anything you've done to the picture, it will apply it to a copy of your original file, and then you can email it and do all these other things. It will not hurt the original, so you can always go back and retweak it and send it out again because you're never touching the original file. Whether it's RAW or JPEG, same thing. So now I've highlighted the ones I want to send out. If I click on Export, up here, export to, I can either email it or I can put it on a hard drive or I could even burn a disk. So if you go to email, there are a bunch of questions it asks you. Do you want to rename the file? If it's a video, you've got to fill in some information. Do you want to send it as a JPEG or a TIFF? Now, as an email, it only lets you send a JPEG because it knows TIFF files are too big. And you can usually use sRGB as the appropriate color space. And you have to know probably that your email attachments, most people can't be more than 20 megabytes. So if you have a lot of files, you might want to reduce the quality down to maybe 60 or 50, which is fine for most people. Um, you can resize if you want, because if people only have a monitor, you don't need a 6,000 pixel wide picture that came out of your camera. And then at the end, this is where you can put your copyright information. Somebody asked me, the watermark? If you've set up a watermark, you can see it says single, I've 
embedded a watermark in Lightroom, you click on this and then the watermark appears on the picture or you can have the watermark appear in the metadata, not on the picture, but buried in the information if people know how to access it. So this is just a, a quick overview you know, for everything. Obviously, there are many, many more specific questions. That's why we have classes and books and private lessons and seminars. Um, I hope I got you enthused more than anything else, that you see the beauty of this, all the things you can do. I just want to mention here in my PowerPoint, if I may, at the end here, um, oh, by the way, this is, this is important. You'll run into this quickly. Um, if you ever get a picture and you get this ast ast exclamation point, exclamation point, and you go, to, go into develop, you're going to get this nasty message. It says the file could not be found. That is because you brought the file into Lightroom when it was on one folder or one hard drive, and then some time ago you changed hard drives or moved the folder, and now Lightroom doesn't know where the pictures are. So you can click on this icon, and it takes you back to uh, your directory, and you can say to Lightroom, oh, I'm sorry, I moved all the files to this hard drive instead of this one. Lightroom Mobile, if you pay for the subscription, you can shoot with your cell phone and put it on your computer. It automatically goes up to the cloud and bounces down. Or if you have pictures in your computer, you can put them on your cell phone. So I took a picture in my office the other day with my cell phone. And it showed up in Lightroom five minutes later. Or if I have pictures in Lightroom, you can link it to your cell phone, and it shows up on your cell phone. It's very, very cool. Um, other stuff, GPS, we talked about making a book. I, you can make a book through Lightroom. They have a connection to Blurb. So you can make a book right from Lightroom for the pictures you want. You can do your layouts and text. Can someone turn the lights on? Back there.